This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. Saltpeter. Here we are again on the cusp of July, with the year half over already. Boy, does time fly. And we here at the Word of the Week are getting ready to shut down the office for a few days, grab us some hamburgers and hot dogs, fire up the old barbecue grill, and celebrate the birth of our nation, the United States of America, by blowing up small chunks of it. We are referring, of course, to the annual tradition of setting off fireworks to mark America's Independence Day on July 4th. And we have to admit that we, like most video gamers, love a good explosion. We're all for fireworks. But we often find ourselves wondering how and why fireworks became such a big part of the American founding celebration. Of course, we generally focus our discussions on medieval history, especially the medieval European history that has informed our favorite tabletop role-playing games. So it might seem like that question doesn't really have any place in our show. Except for the fact that we wouldn't be using fireworks to celebrate the birth of our country if ancient Chinese alchemists hadn't accidentally invented ghost repellent while they were trying to come up with a way to live forever. Nor would we be lighting off bottle rockets and Roman candles if not for one of the greatest and most famous late medieval explorers in history. Probably. And honestly, while we celebrate the birth of American history with fireworks, it was fireworks that brought about the demise of the medieval European period that our favorite games feature so heavily. So indulge us as we talk about fireworks, their ingredients, and a related little invention that had an oh-so-very tiny impact on the history of the Western world. Let's start with a question we posed in the first paragraph of this introduction. Why do we modern Americans celebrate Independence Day with explosive pyrotechnic displays? Because that's what fireworks are, if you don't know. Fireworks are explosive devices designed to produce striking, colorful displays and loud noises, and they are often detonated as part of celebrations, and not just any old random ammunition you happen to have laying around your property. And the United States doesn't have the monopoly on celebrating stuff with fiery, sparkly explosions. Worldwide, about 660 million U.S. dollars are spent on fireworks, and while 175 million pounds of those fireworks are exploded by excited Americans on Independence Day, they are also used in China as part of New Year's celebrations and in Japan during a variety of summer festivals known as Hanabi Taikai. There are many such festivals throughout Japan during the summer, including over 800 weekend festivals in the month of August. But again, how did they become a part of America's Independence Day? Well, there's two reasons why we set off fireworks. The first is because that's what statesman, founding father, and the second president of the United States wanted. Seriously, in 1776, on July 3rd, the date before the Declaration of Independence was formally signed, thereby declaring the 13 American colonies a sovereign nation divorced from its parent nation, England, John Adams wrote to his wife Abigail that he thought a fireworks display would be the best way to celebrate the event, and further expressed his hope that Americans would mark the momentous and historical nation every year thereafter in similar fashion. So there's that. The second reason is because we always have. See, across the fledgling nation, many folks did mark the occasion in 1776 with pyrotechnic displays as well as the firing of guns and cannons. And it's not just because John Adams said they should. See, at the time, America was actually in the midst of a guerrilla war with England, fighting for the very independence they declared. See, the American Revolutionary War really broke out in earnest more than a year before the Declaration of Independence was a thing. Tension had been rising between the various American colonies and the government back home in England for quite a while. Really, things started brewing as far back as 1765. And various acts of protest and civil unrest were becoming increasingly common, such as the famous Boston Tea Party, which we recently mentioned in our episodes about tea and coffee. 
1773. As resistance grew, British and Loyalist forces were starting to get a little nervous, especially because everyone in the frontier colonies was armed. Because they were frontier colonies. The colony of Massachusetts had become an especially smoldering hotbed of unrest and resistance, and the colonial militia was stockpiling weapons and ammunition, especially gunpowder. On April 19, 1775, British forces attempted to disarm the militia by seizing a stockpile of weapons and gunpowder in Concord, Massachusetts, which today is a part of the state of Vermont. And the militia was having none of it. They put up a fight and open combat broke out. Basically, that was the point at which the match was put to the fuse. After that first skirmish in Concord, the British Army attempted to seize control of Boston, the capital of Massachusetts, and put down the rebellion. But they were driven out by the armed rebel populace and forced to retreat. So by the time of the first fireworks celebration in 1776 on July 4th, America was at war. And the first fireworks displays were actually morale-boosting celebrations for the troops especially because American morale was running low following a failed attempt to liberate Quebec and Canada and the loss of New York City to British forces. It wouldn't be until a major victory in Saratoga, New York in 1777 that the tide would turn again in favor of the American rebels. But here's the thing. Fireworks celebrations are a lot older than American independence. In fact, Firework celebrations were imported from the very country America was declaring independence from. See, fireworks had actually been around in Europe since about 1295 CE, and they were especially popular in England, especially among English medieval royalty. It's believed that the first official government-sanctioned royal fireworks celebration took place in 1486 and celebrated the marriage of King Henry VII which gave his son, Henry VIII, the idea to do the same at his marriage to Anne Boleyn. And their daughter, Elizabeth, who would become Queen Elizabeth I, loved fireworks so much that she established the position of official court firemaster. In 1685, King James knighted a particularly talented fireworks technician. Meanwhile, in 1608, Captain John Smith supposedly conducted the first fireworks display in the Americas, which he'd had imported from England. During these celebrations, masters of the craft, so-called firemasters, would set off the displays while their assistants, known as green men, would assist. The green men were so-called because they wore hats of fresh green leaves, which they would use to put out any stray sparks while they worked the crowd. Despite England's love of fireworks displays, England really isn't too well known for its fireworks. In the West, we pretty much recognize the Italians as the masters of pyrotechnics, and we celebrate the works of some very old families who made their fortunes creating fireworks. These include the Gruccis, Rosies, and Zambellis. And the fact is that modern fireworks were pretty much developed in Italy. Even though, as we'll talk about in a moment, the first fireworks were invented in China and spread to Europe, those fireworks bore little resemblance to what we consider to be fireworks today. It was Italian chemists and metallurgists who experimented with the Chinese invention and discovered that different powdered metals produced different colors when burned. Sodium, for example, burns yellow, barium produces green, and strontium produces a red color. Interestingly enough, to this day, no chemist has discovered a way to make a nice, pure blue color. Blue fireworks are the hardest to make, and a pure, bright blue flame is a sort of holy grail of the fireworks industry. Though we should note that copper chloride does serve as an okay blue. But we digress. As we said, it was the Italians who figured out how to produce specific sounds and colors in their fireworks displays. And they also developed the aerial shell in the 1830s that not only allowed fireworks to be launched high into the air, but also allowed the shaping of the explosive display. The Italian pyromancers discovered that by changing the inner shape of the shell, they could produce all sorts of differently shaped explosions. 
but they didn't actually invent fireworks. Fireworks themselves were invented by the Chinese, as you probably know. But what you may not know is that the first fireworks weren't explosive at all. And the explosive fireworks were invented accidentally when someone tried to make immortality powder out of a skin treatment. Yeah, we kid you not. The thing is, the very first fireworks at all probably shouldn't be called fireworks. Technically, they were a bit like firecrackers, but even for firecrackers, they were a bit sad. The idea was that if you took a sealed bamboo tube and tossed it in a fire, the air inside would expand due to the heat until the tube exploded with a loud pop. Yep, the first fireworks were basically bamboo popcorn. But it was believed that the loud noise of the explosion would frighten off evil spirits, especially those that threatened to cause problems in the new year. Thus, these little bamboo crackers were used to celebrate the new year in ancient China. Meanwhile, somewhere around 800 CE, Chinese alchemists were trying to figure out a medicine that would grant the user eternal life. And this was nothing new for Chinese alchemists. We've mentioned a few times, especially in our Willow Bark episode, how the pursuit of immortality juice was basically the driving force behind everything Chinese alchemists invented. And apparently by accident, some Chinese alchemists mixed together three ingredients, and when his mixture was heated, it didn't produce eternal life at all. In fact, eventually, the mixture would remove life from a lot of people. But it was this mixture which was added to the bamboo tubes by a monk named Li Tian, who lived during the Song Dynasty, that produced the first real explosive fireworks, which he, and others, used to scare away evil spirits much more efficiently. And thus the first fireworks were invented. Now any gamer of a certain age, and with the proper cultural pedigree, knows exactly what three ingredients were mixed together to produce explosive powder that Li Tian used in his firecrackers. Because the same three ingredients and the same bamboo shoot can also kill alien lizard folk on distant planets. Way back in 1964, this American screenwriter and television producer named Eugene Wesley Roddenberry had an idea for a science fiction series that combined the themes of exploration and Gulliver's travels with the devil-may-care frontier heroes of the westerns that were popular at the time. He called it a wagon train to the stars, and that's how he sold it. But privately, he saw it as more of a combination of a morality play and a way to explore serious cultural issues in an approachable, entertaining way. He envisioned altruistic and moralistic heroes confronting social and cultural dilemmas and resolving them. With the help of Desilu Productions, Desi Arnaz and Lucio Ball's groundbreaking television production studio we discussed in our episode about the sweater, Roddenberry developed a pilot episode which he pitched to the National Broadcasting Corporation, NBC. And they hated it. Well, they didn't hate it, hate it. They loved the idea, but they found the actual pilot episode, The Cage, kind of not good. But in a move that was pretty much unprecedented, they asked for another, different pilot to see if it might be better. And it was. That one was called Where No Man Has Gone Before. It featured a different captain, a few different characters, and some other tweaks, and it was a big success, initially. But Star Trek, and we hope you figured out what we were talking about by now, Star Trek faced its share of struggles. Its subject matter was sometimes controversial, and Roddenberry and his cast and crew were fighting constantly against NBC's censors to be true to the vision of the show, which they intended to be both progressive and countercultural so as to resonate with the culture at the time. And its ratings were up and down. Executives changed the time slot to sabotage the show. Roddenberry threatened to quit. Fans wrote letters. The show was canceled and uncanceled and changed owners. It was a big mess. But that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about a specific episode of the show. One of the most famous and popular episodes of the show. The first season episode called Arena, which aired in January of 1967. 
In that episode, Captain Kirk of the USS Enterprise and his trusted officers Spock and Dr. McCoy arrive at an alien planet because they've been invited over to another officer's place for dinner. No, really, that's how it starts. But you just knew something bad was going to happen, partly because it was the beginning of an hour-long television show, and something bad has to happen to make it worth watching. And partly because they teleported down to the planet's surface along with three other crew members who had never appeared before and would never appear again in the show. Wearing red shirts, if you know what we mean. Anyway, surprise, surprise, the dinner invitation was a trap. The space colony the crew was visiting had been attacked and destroyed by reptilian aliens called the Gorn. The heroes fight the Gorn. There's a chase, space war, and the Enterprise has the Gorn at its mercy when suddenly... Captain Kirk and Captain Lizardlips find themselves ripped from their ships and teleported to a desert planet to fight it out like the savages they are. No, really. See, during the battle, the Enterprise and the Gorn ship had strayed into the territory of another alien race that didn't particularly care for conflict. In fact, they found conflict inexcusable. So they used their godlike powers because godlike aliens are just the norm in Star Trek. They used their godlike powers to transport Kirk and Captain Lizardlips to a specially prepared battle planet where they could settle their differences. The problem, of course, is that the Gorn is a massive, powerful lizard, and Kirk is a pink-skinned, hairless ape. And so, the battle should have been one-sided, but the aliens had made sure Kirk had the tools he needed to win. For reasons. Kirk tries to reason with the Gorn. The Gorn proves to be unreasonable. Kirk explores the train, figures out a way to win, and incapacitates the Gorn. And then, just as he has the Gorn at his mercy, he refuses to kill the Gorn. And the godlike aliens are so impressed by his lack of savagery and mercy for an opponent that would have offered him none in return, that they make everything okay. Yay, happy ending. Lesson learned. But the important takeaway from that episode is that you can make a small cannon by mixing together sulfur, charcoal, and saltpeter, stuffing them into a bamboo tube, and then loading the thing with diamonds. That's the lesson every nerd learned. Gunpowder is made of sulfur, charcoal, and saltpeter, and that's what the Chinese alchemists stumbled upon. Oh, and then Chinese warriors discovered that if you stuffed it into a bamboo tube with a bunch of shrapnel, you could make a hand cannon. Sort of. We'll get to that. Anyway, saltpeter. Sulfur is a highly reactive chemical element. Charcoal is an excellent carbon-based fossil fuel. But just what the heck is saltpeter? Well, saltpeter is actually one of two chemicals, potassium nitrate and or sodium nitrate. It's basically a granular mineral that occurs when nitrogenous metabolic wastes, such as the chemicals in animal urines and decomposing animal corpses, mix with certain minerals in the soil. And it's an excellent spice and preservative for food. Provided you don't think too hard about the fact that it comes from urine or rotting corpses. And it was used for such purposes in China for a long time. It was also used in China to treat skin and gum irritation. In fact, it's a common ingredient even today in ice creams and toothpastes that are designed specifically for people with sensitive teeth. Don't worry if you use Sensodyne toothpaste. We don't use urine or corpses to make saltpeter anymore. It's mostly produced synthetically from compounds that are mined in various countries like Chile. Sodium nitrate and various related compounds like nitric acid and trinitrotoluene, which is what TNT stands for, are very volatile compounds. If you put a small amount of energy in, you get a large amount of energy out. It excites the electrons that hold its atoms together. The electrons dance around in a frenzy for a bit and then blow off all that energy. And in so doing, they blow the bonds that hold the atoms together to bits. And a huge amount of energy comes out. More or less. We're very briefly summarizing. The point is, add this stuff to sulfur and charcoal, 
and you have what the Chinese called Huo Yao, aka black powder, aka gunpowder, aka the end of medieval history. See, it didn't take the Chinese long to realize that scaring away ghosts wasn't the only thing you could do with this stuff. You could also turn people into ghosts very efficiently. For example, as we noted, if you load black powder into a bamboo tube or later a brass tube and you set it on fire, a blast of fire will issue forth. They called that weapon a fire lance. You could also load scraps of metal in there, not diamonds like Kirk did. And then you had a blast of fire and hot sharp metal. And that wasn't all. You could also put small tubes of the stuff on the ends of arrows so they would explode and start fires or, and this is kind of cruel, you could strap a little tube of the stuff to a rat and set it loose to attack an enemy town or castle or fortification. Yeah, they did that. Around about the 10th century CE, the Chinese developed all of these ideas using their Huo Yao. Now the Chinese knew they had a particularly powerful military invention on their hands, so they tried their best to keep it a secret. But despite their attempts, word got out, it spread to India. And when the Chinese ended up at war with the Mongols, the Mongols ended up with cannons and bombs. And by 1320, it had traveled along the trade routes from China to Europe, especially along the Silk Road, and the first cannons appeared in Italy. Now. This is the part where we bring up Marco Polo and an interesting misconception. At least, we think it's interesting. Marco Polo was a famous medieval explorer from Venice who traveled with his brother multiple times to China. He and his brother spent 24 years traveling into, around, and through China. He and his brother documented their findings, kept journals, and brought numerous ideas home with them to Europe. And he and his brother even explored places no European had ever been, such as Mongolia and Beijing. And he and his brother even became confidence of a ruler of the Mongol Empire, Kublai Khan, who founded the Yuan Dynasty in China. And he earned a place in the annals of history as the greatest and most influential explorer of the medieval period. And did you know he had a brother? Neither did anyone else. Obviously, a lot about Marco Polo has been exaggerated. He'd been the subject of many books, and he inspired many famous explorers. And it's hard to know what's true and what's not. Historians agree that he did definitely exist. And he did definitely travel to China. But after that, any of the fanciful stories might be just that. Fanciful stories. What's interesting, too, is that he's often credited with bringing fireworks to Europe, and maybe he did. Or maybe the idea came along the Silk Road. But what's truly interesting is that gunpowder reached Europe first, as in before Marco. Smiths and metallurgists and alchemists in Italy were already working with gunpowder when Marco Polo said, Hey, check out a Disney to fireworks I found in China. And his brother whispered quietly, You mean a we found? And he said, Shut up a your face. Because the first cannons were already being developed in Italy at the time. But it was the Europeans who really turned gunpowder into a thing. Their talented metalwork allowed them to gradually build smaller, more portable types of cannons. See, the Arabians, the Indians, the Mongols, the Chinese, they liked cannons, but they had become a little gun-shy about smaller arms because they were unreliable and tended to injure or kill the bearer more often than the enemy. But the European smiths got really good and eventually worked out various mechanisms to make guns work properly. And as you probably know, guns became a great equalizer. Once cannons and handheld firearms became available, the knight was pretty much obsolete. It didn't take years and years of training and dedication and huge amounts of money to become a monster on the battlefield. You just needed a gun and a weekend to learn how to use it, more or less. 
you get the point. And fancy castle walls were useless against cannonballs and explosives. And so, as we said, the medieval period ended and the social class of the night pretty much vanished forever. And that is also why the American revolutionaries had to hold on to their firearms at any cost. Because it was those weapons that leveled the playing field and allowed a bunch of frontier rabble to win their freedom from one of the most powerful armies and empires in the world. Which is what we're heading out to celebrate with a burger, beer, and a bottle rocket. Happy Independence Day to our American listeners. And happy birthday, America. This has been GM Word of the Week. It's written and researched by the Angry GM and produced by me, Fiddleback. You can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash gmwordoftheweek. You can find more at gmwordoftheweek.com and theangrygm.com. <laughs>